My name is Alex Clare. I'm from uh, London and England. I was born in uh, South East London, um, probably the dullest place on earth, possibly. Um, 31 years ago. Uh, yeah, two, two very, very lovely parents. Um, I was born in a part of London which was famous for William Shakespeare's Globe Theatre and, uh, you know, has a, has a long musical legacy which is always, for me, a, a big inspiration, a big incentive growing up to, to sort of pursue a career in the music industry. Um, when I was seven years old, they were giving out three lessons in my, music lessons in my school. And for some reason, my parents decided that it'd be good that I learned, but I got to pick the instrument. So I thought, what was the most noisy and antisocial instrument I could possibly learn? And that was the trumpet. So I got a trumpet at seven years old, and I started playing it, making a lot of noise. And uh, so much noise that my parents used to lock me in the bathroom to practice, to sort of stop disturbing people. And if that wasn't antisocial enough, by the time I got to 11, um, I decided I wanted to play the drums. So I became a drummer. I started playing percussion and drums. I started taking lessons at school. And all through elementary school, all through junior high, we don't call it that in England, but whatever, um, all through junior high, I started playing music with bands, all types of music, all types of people I was mixing with to learn how to play music. And um, it was fantastic. Really, really fantastic. I recommend, you know, for me, I was a very clumsy kid. I was a very clumsy kid. And um, I think really the incentive for my parents was to give me some coordination, you know, <laughs> to like actually be able to get some motor development and, you know, it's just fantastic. And it really worked. Loved music. My good parents have a very big record collection, lots of blues and soul music, and I got very, very into this music. I actually learned to sing from listening to uh, American soul records. A lot of Americans, when they hear me sing, they're very surprised. Uh, they're very surprised because I sing with an American accent. They're even more surprised when I sing Jewish music and I have a Hasidic Shahavara. That, was, <laughs> that freaks them out even more. They're like, what's going on here, man? Seriously. Anyway. I didn't have a very religious upbringing, um, that's why I haven't mentioned it yet, because I really had no um, formal Jewish education as a kid, nothing, literally nothing at all. Um, a strong sense of identity, and I would occasionally, unlike the rest of my family, I would occasionally go to the local reform shul, which was not so far from my house, because um, I felt like it was an important thing to do for some reason. Um, but gradually, as I was growing through my teenage years, music really became the main focus in my life. Um, so much so, by the time it came to think about leaving school and going to college, I decided that uh, I really wanted to be a drummer. So I told my parents, you can imagine what they said. <laughs> they were like, really, you're going to be a drummer? Maybe, maybe try to do something that has a little bit more uh, you know, durability, a little bit more longevity. So I, I enrolled in a, in, a, in, a, in a culinary school to learn how to be a chef. Now, I went to chef school, but the band I was playing were doing quite well. We were getting quite a lot of notice, quite a lot of uh, renown as these young boys from South London playing in London, England. And uh, in my second year of college, I didn't tell my parents, but I dropped out and I went on tour, um, which was great. We're still working it out, you know, um, 15 years later, but it's okay. They've forgiven me. Um, I went on tour with this band and things started snowboarding and then the band broke up. However, I made connections, I networked, I got around the sort of London music scene which is really one of the most prominent in the world. You know, there's so many mu great musicians come out of London and there's such a, a good support network for musicians in London, um, be it a little bit rough and ready, that I moved at the age of 19 from my home in South London to North West London. Now, when people say North West London, they usually assume gold is green, but I moved to a place called Camden Town. Camden Town was the hub, and in many ways still is the hub of media, of music, of television, of art, of the so more avant-garde creative sectors in the UK. And uh, I was living there, 18, 19 years old, complete freedom, living in a house full of musicians, and it was amazing. You know, as a young, as a teenager, everything I, and as, as a kid, all I aspired to be was a professional musician. I was actually doing it now. I got a job for a music publisher called Pure Groove Music. And from that publishing deal, I played as much as I possibly could all the time. Shows almost every single night of the week. Um, studio sessions, 
working in studios, working in music venues, working in bars where there was music played, that I could play gigs there when I wasn't, you know, serving beers. And uh, before too long, I made and assembled a, a collection of work, a collection of songs that I'd written. And a lot of record companies heard about me, and they started making very big offers to sign me. Now, when you're a musician, it's not a conventional job in as much as, you know, if you go to college or you pursue a career, you can get like an internship or you can get a college loan. You can't get that if you're going to be a musician. It doesn't work. No one's going to give you a, a, a university loan on a tuition um, when you're a musician. So between the age of 18 and, you know, 22, when I really first signed my first major, major deal, um, I was very, very hard up. I lived in a terrible accommodation, I ate terrible food, and by the time I was offered my first major record deal, um, it was tremendously life-changing. From having no money, they suddenly gave me £150,000, which for a kid in his early 20s, you know, a kid in his 30s, £150,000 is a lot of money, and it, you know, it changed my life. Not only that, but when I signed into Island Records, you know, one of the biggest record companies in the world, they sent me from you know, London, they sent me to Jamaica to record music in Jamaica with Jamaican musicians. They sent me to New Orleans and Louisiana to record with jazz musicians and record and sample live the sounds of the New Orleans street. And then they sent me to Los Angeles, California, where I was there for, for quite a few months. And I was really living the dream as a musician. Okay, let's go back a bit. When I was a, a, a kid, I always felt a sense of presence of a college baruch in my life. I always had a muna, so to speak. I always felt that there was some level of hashkocha going on in the world. It wasn't a new concept to me and it wasn't something that, uh, you know, I was in a shir once in a, in a Baal Tshuva Yeshiva and they were asking uh, questions to Bali Tshuvas. You know, why did you become a religious person? Why did you become from you know, and uh, lots of reasons, very intellectual, very lofty, and some quite pretentious. And uh, someone asked me why, yeah, and I just said, well, I have a bit of a taiva for Shabbos. I really like Shabbos, and that's, for me, something that really brought me close to Yiddishkeit. Um, anyway, my music career is taking off. I'm about to sign my major record deal, my first, sorry, my first publishing deal. And I was living in a, in a house in Camden Town in London with a bunch of other musicians, some very successful now and on their way to being very successful then. And I was watching a TV show on a Thursday night with a friend of mine um, who was you know, much more advanced in terms of where he wanted to be in the music industry, where he was in terms of you know, life goals um, in a very successful band. I mean, watching a TV show, I think it was even a sports show, it wasn't, his, it wasn't his team who were playing in the sports show, but suddenly he started crying. 28-year-old guy, a big mentor to me, a big friend, he just started crying for no reason whatsoever. And I looked at him a little bit freaked out. I was like, you right there, man? How's it going? And he was like, I don't know. And it's very strange, you know, when you're 21 years old and you have a friend who's a an older mentor and suddenly they just break down and have this little emotional episode. It doesn't really make sense and I really wanted to know like what's happening? Why do you feel so sad? And he said, well, I don't feel very fulfilled. I don't feel very fulfilled. Like what am I doing in my life? You know, we go out every night, we go to all the parties, go to all the clubs, go to all the bars. Everything is free. Everything is laid out for us. We have a great time. I'm doing exactly what I, do, what I want to do, but I'm just not a happy person. I'm not happy. <coughs> yeah, okay. He said, uh, he, he, my friend said he wasn't happy. He was, just, he was just unhappy. And I started thinking about my life and what I was really, what I really held to be important and what I really held to be true and what I really wanted to get out of life. And, um, and I started thinking, I, I realized that really in all truth I wasn't particularly happy either. Like, what am I doing? Like, what, what's the point? going out every night, going to bars, going to parties, you know, chasing after tithers and impulses and everything you want, and that's just the norm, that's the, the standard, you know, bare minimum of most musicians, that's the lifestyle. And I realized that it really wasn't very fulfilling. Now, I um, started asking big questions about myself, 
about what I was doing in the world, and I started building up a relationship with, you know, my more traditional friends. I always had a lot of Jewish friends, you know, a lot of them were more traditional myself, and I would always, like, you know, go for Friday night and Shabbos lunch, whenever I had an opportunity, Yom Yom Tovim, etc. But after this conversation, I had an urge to go to, to, to immerse fully, to really, to really take it to the next level. And I got a bus on a Friday morning or Friday afternoon early to Stamford Hill. It's part of the story last night. And I walked into a shul in Stamford Hill. And I asked, as I said last night, uh, a gentleman if there was a couple at Chibetta this evening. And he told me, yes, sure there is. There's Kabbalah Shabbos and the Mincha Namayrav as well, if you're interested. And uh, he's called Dr. Naftali Lowenthal, and he invited me for a meal. I became quite close to him and his family and uh, the community in Stamford Hill. And uh, eventually, from growing in Stamford Hill, going to Shirim, learning about Shabbos, learning about Kashrus, eventually I realized that uh, living in Camden Town wasn't really good die, and I had to move to a more Hamish neighborhood. So I moved from Camden Town in my leather jacket and my skinny jeans to Stamford Hill. Um, which was a trip. <laughs> very, very interesting and uh, beautiful part of my life. Um, and before too long, I was totally Shoma Shabbos. It's totally Shoma Shabbos, totally Shoma Kashras, mitzvahs, learning Torah. Now, this is all happening at the same time that the major record labels in the UK were taking an interest in me. So, uh, the time came that there was a bit of a bidding war between Parlophone, EMI, and, and Island Records Universal. And eventually I made a deal with Universal Music for some of £150,000 for myself to make an album. Now when I signed with them, I said to them, there's something you have to know about me. <laughs> that you might, just, just so you know, I don't work on Friday nights and I don't work on Saturday days. So it looked at me like I was a bit crazy and said, what do you mean? And I said, well, there's this thing called Shabbos. And I'm a Jewish person, as a Jew, like I can't work on, on the Jewish Sabbath, on Shabbos. Now, the only reference they ever had to Shabbos was a Coen Brothers film called The Big Lebowski. Um, there's a character in that movie called Walter, who's also Shoma Shabbos. And when I said Shabbos, they just started quoting this movie at me from the, from the early 90s. Um, what they thought it meant was, I just need a day off to take it easy. They didn't realize the, 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 seri uh, the severity of keeping Shabbos and they thought as a young musician if certain opportunities came my way I would take them because most people who just signed a major record deal take whatever opportunities they can to get to the next level okay so they sent me as I said to Los Angeles they sent me to New Orleans they sent me to Kingston Jamaica and it was amazing it was a fantastic time of my life creating the music I wanted to create and more importantly getting paid to do it you know it was a beautiful thing you know, it's, a, it's a very hard opportunity to get in the music industry and not everyone is, uh, merits it but I had and I was pursuing the dream so when I made my album obviously when you make an album it costs quite a lot of money to make a record especially if you're flying all over the world and a record company wants to recoup some of that money pretty quickly so um, towards the end of 2010, the beginning of 2011, it came time for me to release my first single. I released my first single, it was a song called Up All Night, and it didn't do very well. It didn't do well at all actually. No one really bought it or really cared about this song, which made my record company sit up in alarmment and concern. Um, but then we released the second single. The second single, we released that, and it actually did okay in Romania and in the Netherlands. <laughs> I guess it did really well there. So I was traveling, you know, almost every month to Shabbos, I was flying off to either Romania or to, uh, to, to, to Holland, to, 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 to um, Amsterdam, to play shows, to do promo, whatever. But it wasn't quite bringing in the cash that the record company wanted. Then, came to release my album, and I released my album, and it got some critical acclaim, actually. Some critics really liked it, some critics absolutely panned it. And, um, yeah, my record company were a little bit frustrated. Now, this is where the story really starts getting interesting. Um, because of the personal nisyonas that I, I, I went through, and uh, Baruch Hashem, also the, the huge Siyatha Deshema that came out of it. So, uh, in spring of 2011, I was asked to go on tour with a, with a, tour, a musical tour, supporting, being the warm-up act for a young lady called Adele. We just won a bunch of Grammys and 
Back then, she'd also just won a bunch of Grammys. She was huge, you know, selling millions and millions of records. A UK artist from the same part of London as I was, um, who was really selling a lot, of, uh, a lot of records and becoming very, very popular all over the world. And they asked me to be the act before she played. Amazing opportunity. And I looked in the calendar, and it was springtime, springtime tour, and I realized that over a three-week tour, bang in the middle of the tour was Pesach. <laughs> So I said to my record company, guys, there's something I have to tell you. <laughs> and I said, you know that Shabbos thing? And they were like, yeah. And I said, well, basically, I've got a week of Shabbos just uh, in the middle of this tour, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. So, I, so we spoke to Adele's people, and uh, they were very understanding and very, very nice about it. My record company, however, were very concerned. They were like, you know, we're struggling to get the opportunities that you need to take your to career to the next level to really get you out there. Um, and this, is, this was a tremendous opportunity that you're willing to pass by. And I said, I have no choice. It's, it's Pesach. I can't work on two days of Yom Tov. Even if I was permitted to, learn, uh, to work on the Cholamayad, there's a Shabbos bang in the middle. So it's not, you know, that's five days. Five days in total out of, uh, you know, a, a, a two and a bit week tour. It's not, you know, just on a three week tour. It's not really, it's not really going to work out. So I got called in for a meeting with the managing director of Universal Music and Island Records. And they sat down and they said, Alex, and you said you needed a holiday every now and then. We assumed that it meant you were going to go interrailing around Europe or sit on a beach in Ibiza. We didn't quite realize that for you a holiday is a, a religious obligation. I was like, yeah, it's a kicker, huh? <laughs> they were like, yeah, this is, this is okay, but we have to work with it. You know, people are very politically correct nowadays. We don't live in the previous generations where you know, if someone didn't come into work on, on, on Shabbos, they lost their job. It's not like that anymore. It can't be. It's called discrimination and there's laws and things in place to stop that happening. So my record company had to respect it as much as they possibly could. The summer was great. I toured all over Europe, um, toured all over the UK. And by the end of the summer, from the beginning of the summer, I was playing to 120 people. By the end of the summer, I was playing to like 500, 400, uh, 500, 600, 700 people. And I was building up a very strong live following. The, uh, the CDs weren't selling, but I was selling tickets for live shows which is good for me, but not for the record company, because they make their revenue off of CDs. Okay. So, at the end of the summer, coming up towards Tishrei, and I said to my record label, remember that week of Shabbos? <laughs> I've basically got a month of Shabbos. <laughs> and they were like, what? I was like, yeah, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, like, it's not, I'll just, you know, I'll probably do a few things in between the days, but uh, just, you know, if anything comes in, don't, don't tell me, because what's the point? Okay, poor, poor record label. He was just dealing with this crazy person, you know. They thought I was actually insane, and they're probably right. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah. They were so frustrated because, for some reason, they had been offered lots of amazing promo opportunities, lots of fantastic shows, but for some reason, they were always booked in for Friday nights. And I had to turn down opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, radio shows, TV shows, um, live performances. Um, and it was very frustrating for them. I mean, to be honest, it was a little bit frustrating for me that they couldn't find another day of the week. Um, so, <coughs> Rosh Hashanah that year, fantastic davening. I davened in London by a man called Reb David Tukentaf, he's a big tzaddik, a special person, he's been a huge mishpir on me, and a lot of other young men um, and women in London. Um, a truly remarkable and you know tremendous Ohev Yisroel and my personal Rav, I learned in a, in a, in a koilal of a, of a Poizek in Yerushalayim and still want to have a shayla, I'll phone up Rabbi Tukentaft in London, very special person to me. I davened in his minion um, on Rosh Hashanah, very nice davening, I said Hashem reflective, I'm trying to fix all the, 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 the problems I've created in Adam Lech and then Yom Kippur happens, and to be honest, it was a little bit long and schleppy. But, you know, I had some good books to read, and uh, anyway, Motsi Yom Kippur. Motsi Yom Kippur in 2011. I, uh, I come home, I turn on my cell phone, I break my fast, in that order. That's the way it goes nowadays. And on breaking my fast and seeing my cell phone, I have a text message from my record label which is very unusual because Yom Kippur that year was on a Shabbos. Now, the music industry as such isn't Shomer Shabbos. People don't keep Shabbos, and most of them aren't Jewish, but 
Saturday is kind of like an off day for the music industry because Friday night is such a big night. It's sort of the, all the preparations for the week build up in the music industry for Friday night performances, TV shows, radio shows, whatever, that people are usually a little bit exhausted on, on, on Shabbos on Saturday. So it's very unusual that someone from a record label would call you on a Saturday. What's more is, even though there's not a lot of Yidden working in the music industry, there's enough to people, that people should know that Yom Kippur is a big deal. So it's very, very strange that I had a, 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 a text message from my record label. And it said, call us straight away. What's the Yom Kippur? What could, what could it be? And uh, I call up my A&R man. The A&R man is the, the liaison between the record label and the artist. And I call him up and I say, what's up, Nick? And he says, well, we've got an amazing opportunity for you. And the best thing is, it's not on a Friday night. I'm like, amazing. Fantastic. What a great opportunity. He said, yeah. It's to play on uh, BBC One, BBC Radio One's Live Lounge. Now, if you are from the UK, you'll know what Radio One is. It's, uh, it's the main radio station in the UK. If you want to get music into the charts in the UK, into the Hot 100, you have to have radio play on Radio One. No radio play on Radio One, you're not going to get a, a song anywhere near the top 10, even the top 40. Now, they wouldn't play my music because I was fusing a type of music that was uh, very avant-garde, very electronic, with soul music. You know, something very melodic and harmonious and very nice, and smushing the two together. And they didn't really get it. Like, they, it was a bit, a bit ahead of the curve, so to speak. And Radio 1 hadn't played any of my music apart from on the new music shows and the sort of dance music shows, which are late at night, you know, on the graveyard shift. And now they wanted to give me an opportunity to play live on radio to millions of listeners in the UK and millions of listeners all over the world. And the best thing was it was on a Thursday night. Fantastic. So I said to them, that's amazing, guys. Can I ask you, which Thursday? And they said, well, it's next Thursday. It was Matsu Shabbos Yom Kippur, and I made the question in my head, and I realized it was the second night of Sukkot. And I said, is there any way, is there any way possible at all that they can move, move the, the, the show? And they said, no. And I was like, can you tell them I'm Jewish? And like, I can't work on Thursday night? And they were like, no, we, we thought about that, but to be honest, Alex, we have to give you an ultimatum. He says, you have a choice to make. We can't pursue this relationship. We can't for a good money off the bat if you're going to turn down all these opportunities. And um, if you don't do the show, we're going to have to let you go. Now, for a young man who'd invested everything from the age of seven, you know, creatively, my whole focus had been, been on making music and creating music, and I'd had amazing opportunities, and suddenly they were about to be, uh, the rug was about to be pulled out from underneath my feet. You know, a major label, a major record label, gives you the logistical infrastructure to, uh, to release music, to sell songs. They take care of press, they take care of tour expenses, they take care of everything you need to get out there and to get your music out there. And that was all about to disappear. And I thought for a second, and I remembered something I saw that Yom Kippur. Now, the Art Scroll Maxor is a fantastic, fantastic thing, which uh, whoever put it together is a very special person, or the, the team of people who put it together. And in the Art Scroll Maxor, it has Purushim on you know, Mepharashim are nearly all of the, of the, of the, of the songs in there, all the uh, Pyotin, all of the Zemiris, all the Oitzris, whatever's in there, it's, 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 it's all spoken about and discussed broadly in the Art Scroll Machsa. Very nice. Now, there's a, 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 a Piyot from Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah called Onasane Taikif. Onasane Taikif, now I'm a big music fan, obviously, and um, I grew up listening to the music of Leonard Cohen, Oliver Shalom. And uh, I realized when we were seeing Unasani Toikif, I realized that it was actually a Leonard Cohen song. A song called Who By Fire. I was reading the words and I was like, whoa, wow, Leonard Cohen wrote a period. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I hopped. I was like, no, no, there was once a Yom Kippur where he was sitting in shul and he was just reading through the maxim. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Unasani Toikif, wow. Discussing Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Yom Hadin discussing what happens in the base of Dinshul Maila, that every living thing is taken into account and counted and valued. That every living thing will be judged for life or chas v'shalom, the opposite. Who will live, who will die, how people are going to die. You know, it goes into great gory detail, you know. 
Chemex, Rafer, Skila, all the good stuff. It's all in there. And it's, you know, it's just a, what an amazing, amazing piece of uh, liturgy. It just blew my mind. And I started reading about Nasani Taikif and, its, and its, its author. It was a man called Amnon of Mainz. Amnon of Mainz was a, uh, one of the early Ashkenazi Rabbana. We don't know much about him. We know he lived in the middle between the years 1000 and 1100, somewhere around there. And we know that he wrote on Nasani Taikif. We don't know much else. And there may be a few other liturgical songs that are attributed to him. So I was reading the story of Amnon, and uh, gosh, a little bit heavy and a little bit gory. Amnon made friends with a local uh, bishop, and this local bishop gave him an ultimatum. He said, Amnon, convert to Christianity, or I'm going to kill you. So Amnon famously asked, reflecting the uh, sorry Haruga Malchus, for three days. He asked for three days to think about it to see what he should do and after three days he came to the bishop and he said to the bishop I'm sorry I'm a Jew I'm a Jew I'm not going to be anything else other than a Jew even if I take on your narish kite I'm still going to be a Jew and I have to live as a Jew and if I can't live as a Jew then I have to die as one and Amnon died the bishop for wasting the bishop's time the bishop killed him in the most creatively cruel fashion possible removing Amnon's limbs one by one, tourniqueting as he went, so that he wouldn't bleed to death. And as he was dying, Reb Amnon, he, uh, he wrote the song on the Sunday Tokif, and he was famous, he brought it into the shul, and he sang it. He returned in a dream a year or so later to, uh, to one of his chaverim. And since then, the Sunday Tokif became part of the, the Nusach for Ashkenazim, and eventually for many Sephardim as well. This story blew my mind, and it's a very harrowing account of how a piece of music, you know, every piece of music has a story, as we learned from Rabbi Yossi yesterday, and uh, it just blew my mind, and I realized by Hashkaka Pratis why I had to read it, why it was shaykh to me on that Yom Kippur to read the story of Rabbi Amnon. Now, Rabbi Amnon had three days, I had four days. I had four days, but I realized there was no decision to be made, and I told my record company, you'll have to let me go. And uh, I didn't actually think they would do it. <laughs> I was like, no way, they're not going to let me go, like me, seriously? And no, no, they let me go. They, uh, they, they terminated my contract. And, um, you know, 150,000 pounds is a lot of money. But when you make a record, that money reduces very quickly. Touring expenses, touring is extremely expensive, especially when you're not, if you're playing to venues under 1,000 people, um, you're not really going to make a lot of money. And the overheads are so high that a record company actually takes care of a lot of the expenses of touring. So not only had I just lost my infrastructure logistically for promo and for getting music out there, but also for touring, um, there's something called tour support that a record company is obligated to pay to the musicians associated with a, uh, associated with a uh, signed act. It's called, tour, it's called tour support. And they owed my band 11,000 pounds. Now my contract worked out in such a way that if my, my contract was terminated, the responsibility to pay whatever was owed to people I work with fell on, on me. So I owed three people I was very close to from being a, since, since being a kid, I owed them, between them, 11,000 pounds. Now, it's a lot of money, and when you have no money, it's even more. It's very expensive. And what's more is, you don't want to have a debt with people you care about. It's just not something you, it's, or even people you don't care about, it's not something you want on your shoulders. So I was really stuffed, <laughs> and uh, I really didn't know what to do. I just lost my record deal, and I owe my band 11,000 pounds, and I was a bit, I was a little bit concerned because I didn't have enough money to pay my rent. Now my landlord, Sir Elik a very special person called Red Bobby Hill, who lives in Golders Green in London, and um, very sweetly he said to me, no, it's okay, like, you know, we've paid off our mortgage, and uh, it's okay, like, you can stay here until you get back on your feet, and, you know, We'll take care of it. Hashem. I went to my Rav, I went to Rab David. Rab David took and taft, Shlita, and I said to him, Rabbi, I don't get it. I don't get it. I know this whole Schar Vainish thing, and I know the whole Ziyat Adeshemaya thing, whatever, but, Rabbi, I've lost everything. 
really, I've lost everything. I have like, you know, three months ago, two months ago, the world was, you know, at my feet, and the future was amazing, and now I have nothing left. I have no money, I have no job, I have no means of paying my musicians, I have no means of supporting, like, touring into the future. And I don't get it. I became Shoma Torah, a mitzvah. I became Shoma Shabbos. I did everything I could to grow as an individual, to have Kirva Selukim, to really feel close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, that's all I really wanted. And it has backfired in the most spectacular way. So, uh, my Rav, he was incredible at Chizuk. If ever you're ever feeling a bit down, give me your number and I'll send it to you. I'll get him to give you a call. He's an amazing person. And he said, he said, wow, Alex, he says, don't you see it? Don't you see, he says, you're a shtickle Avraham Avinu. Shtick Avraham Avinu. It's like young Balchuva, like, what more do you want to hear? Then, oh, you know, the guy who found the Kodesh Baruch Hu, like, what more, do you want to, what more do you want to be called? A little bit like Avraham Avinu. It's like, tell me more, Rabbi. And he said, um, he says, you know, Avraham Avinu lived in a time where people didn't understand what Kedusha was. People had no concept of Elokus. They'd been so wrapped up in their own lives, in their own narishkites, pursuing things made of wood and stone that they forgot about the actors of Hashem. People had no idea that Hashem existed. And Abraham Avinu, by process of, you know, logic, he understood that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was a thing. Not only that, but this thing, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, he was so benevolent and so kind that ultimately everything HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to do in the world was from chesed, was from kindness. And Abraham Avinu decided to personify that, to teach the world that there is an Eibishter. And that this Eibishter is going with chasidim toivim at all times. So it's not only that, but Abraham Avinu waited 99 years to have a son. 99 years to find someone who was suitable to teach the world and to continue this message that there was Hashem. 99 years. His whole life. And then he was benched and Yitzchak Avinu was born. A few years later, a few decades later, Abraham Avinu says to Akharaj uh, Baruch, says to Abraham Avinu, Kachno, please take your son. Take your son, take the one thing that's more precious to you than anything else in the world. And if you would, I want a Korban Oila. Abraham Avinu doesn't hesitate. Abraham Avinu, because of his connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Zerizus, is willing the next morning to wake up as early as possible, take his son, his grown son, who he's already invested so much into, and he's willing to sacrifice him. Now, you understand, the Mephorashim explained that Abraham Avinu, one of the things he was told by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to tell the Umas Oilam was, don't sacrifice your kids. <laughs> it's, it's not a thing HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants people to do. Now, suddenly everything had been flipped on its head, and just with a few words from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Abraham Avinu was willing to forget all of that and sacrifice the one thing that meant more to him than anything else. And he was completely willing to do it. He says, Alex, as a result of that decision, we are all here. He says, every single Jewish person that's alive today is around because of Abraham Avinu's willingness to be my Nefesh. His willingness to give up the one thing that meant more than anything to him is why every single Jewish person alive today, every Bubi, every Sayyidi, every child, everybody is around because of that decision. HaKadosh Baruch gave Abraham Avinu a rocha, that his children should be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the shore. He says, Alex, I promise you, if you're willing to be my Senefesh, if you're willing to give up the one thing that's more important to you for, for, for your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he says, I promise you, you will have Siyat HaDashimaya. I promise you. <coughs> so I said, Rabbi, that's very nice. I said, that's beautiful, thank you very much. I still owe my band 11,000 pounds. I still can't pay my rent. And I still don't have, a, you know, when you get dropped from a record label, you're blacklisted. No radio station wants to play your music. No one wants to promote you. No one wants to take a punt because you're that guy who got dropped. The future was not looking particularly bright. So this is where the story gets really strange and the first big click of Seattle Shemaya kicks in. The next morning, Mamish the next morning, 
I went for a coffee with a friend of mine to discuss my woes, <laughs> to like vent about my frustrations. And uh, while I was sitting having coffee in the Golders Green, a little cafe there, I got a phone call from a promoter in, uh, in, in Germany who was running a design symposium um, in the Tempelhof airport um, that evening. Now he said to me, he said, Alex, can you come to Germany tonight? I was like, no, I don't think that's possible. I'm in London right now. And he said, no, is it possible? I mean, we'll give you 11,000 pounds. <laughs> I was like, what? And he said, yeah, we'll give you 11,000 pounds. There was a band who was supposed to play at this event, and they pulled out, and uh, we looked, you know, we looked in, you know, what's, what's hot and new in terms of English music, and your name came up, and we want, to, uh, we want to give you a gig. So I was like, one second, you need to give me five minutes. So I phoned each member of my band, and I said, guys, um, I can't pay you for a gig that we're going to do tonight. If you can do it, that's great. If you can't, we've got problems. But if you're willing to do it, I promise you, I can pay you back everything I owe you up until this point. And of course, being good friends, they were like, absolutely. And we got tickets very, very quickly. And we flew from London to the to Tegel Airport in Berlin. And a few hours later, we were playing a show at the, the, the Tempelhof, which is amazing. Amazing. Amazing about my friends. Uh, were willing to do it, and amazing that Hakodesh uh, Baruch would obviously, uh, yeah. So, first huge piece of Siyat Shemaya. Second piece, I, uh, I didn't know what to do with my time. My career was in tatters. I really needed to like, recoup and really understand like, what, was, what was going on. I decided to go to Yeshiva. I wanted to go to Yeshiva anyway, eventually, and um, you know, take a year out, whatever. And I decided, you know, this is probably the perfect time. However, I don't have any money. So there's an organization called Masa. And I got a grant from Masa, and I got ready to go to Yeshiva, to fly to Eretz Yisrael to go learn Torah. Now, just before I left for Yeshiva, I got an email from a guy called Keith. 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 Keith Rivers. Keith Rivers is a, uh, is a, a, a lovely person and uh, someone who really helped change my life in a big way. Keith works for a small advertising company based in Seattle, Washington. Now, Keith had a friend who lived in LA called Blake. <coughs> Blake was an aspiring musician, and Blake loves English music. Like a lot of musicians in America, they look to England as like, oh, so that's an interesting place where people are making interesting stuff. And uh, he was an Anglophile, and he loved English music. And as a result, whenever a new musician would come out of England, he would make it his, uh, his duty to find out everything about them and buy all their music up to date. So of like, the five people in North America who bought my album, Keith was one of them. <laughs> because his friend Blake was playing the music in his house. And Keith heard it and was like, oh, this is good. I like this. What is this? Anyway, Keith's company had just been commissioned by Microsoft to make a commercial. Now. The funny thing was, is that, you know, I'd been dropped for a couple of months already, and he'd been trying to email Island Records, my record label, to ask them if they, he could have permission to use a piece of my music. And because I was blacklisted from the label, I was, you know, persona non grata, they weren't really interested in who I was or couldn't continue anything to do with me. They'd just been ignoring the emails. Ridiculous. Now, I was the songwriter of a certain piece of music, and as a songwriter, he went through a music publisher to find out who I was and get my contact details to ask me for permission to use the piece of music. And he sent me an email saying, Alex, we really like your song Too Close, and um, we'd love to use it for a commercial. I said, OK, sure. Now, I'd had pieces of music used in commercials in the past, little like 10 second, 15 second clips, whatever, in the background, very low, just to add a bit of background noise. So I assumed this deal was going to be the same until he replied back to that email and said, great, we want to give you $75,000. OK. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? You know, that's the average uh, salary of an outbreak for about 50 years in Yerushalayim. So uh, I was like, yeah, I could, I could learn for a long time with $75,000. Then I realized that uh, I owed my record label you know, £150,000 plus all the other money that I'd invested behind the scenes on, on my music. And I realized that of £75,000, I wasn't going to see a penny. But I was like, hey, you know what? At least it's you know, a big slice of the pie taken off of my shoulders, and eventually that money will recoup, I hope. But I didn't think much more about it. I'm in Yeshiva, in Yerushalayim. And uh, I get a phone call from my management company in the UK. Not my record company, but the people who handled my day-to-day -day, like touring, etc. 
And they said, Alex, we have a call to connect you to in Frankfurt, Germany. <coughs> okay. Now, I mean, sitting in Rechov David Yellen in Yerushalayim, I have a phone call from a guy in Frankfurt, Germany, who says to me, Alex, can you come to Germany tomorrow? <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is weird. Yeah, what, what's, what's happening? And they said, well, we want you to just, just, just come here to do some promo. And I said, to be honest, I don't really have money for the ticket. I don't know how I'm going to afford to get to Frankfurt. And the guy laughed. And he said, don't worry, we'll, we'll pay for it. We'll pay for everything. And I said, can I ask why? Why do you want me to come to Frankfurt? And he said, well, you're going to be number one there in the charts tomorrow. I said, what do you mean I'm going to be number one? He says, yeah, your song's been being played on the radio here for the last few weeks. And... Um, you're going to be number one here. Now what had happened was that the song that was used for Microsoft was put on a, t on, a, on a TV commercial and that TV commercial had been played on every single commercial TV station in the world. Everywhere from Los Angeles to Kuala Lumpur, people were hearing my music. Not only that, but the whole advert commercial was built around my song. Full volume, verse and chorus, People, there's an app, uh, an app for smartphones called Shazam. Now, people were taking out their smartphones when they heard this piece of music they never heard before. A very interesting new sound that wasn't really being played on the radio at the time. Now, curiosity, they were Shazamming using this app to find out what this piece of music was. And millions of people all over the world were hearing it and downloading it, buying it on iTunes. As a result, record stage, uh, radio stations all over the world were putting my music on their playlists. You know, six months before, my music was too ahead of the curve, and they wouldn't play it on radio. Now it was on all the A-lists being played on every single radio, commercial radio station. So the man in Germany said to me, you're number one in Germany, and we need you to come here to do some promos. So I spoke to my Rosh Hashiva, and I said, Rosh Hashiva, I have a few things to take care of. And he was like, yes, you do. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to take a few weeks off. Well, I actually said a few days, and it was a few days. That trip was just literally two days. I flew from uh, Ben Gurion to Frankfurt, and I got off the plane at the airport, and sure enough, my song Too Close was number one in Germany, um, which was really weird. You know, it was uh, a Bakr in a yeshiva with a huge red beard and a, a gray shirt. I'd like to say a white shirt, but I wasn't married at the time, and I'm a Balchuba, so I didn't really know about making shirts crispy white. <laughs> so, um, so as a result, I turned up in my you know, off-white, eggshell gray shirts, my huge red beard at the time, and uh, there I was, number one in Germany. I got a phone call while I was in Germany from London, from the radio station that wouldn't let me play on a night that wasn't Sukkus, to tell me that I was now on their A-list, i.e. they were playing my music on heavy rotation. Unbelievable. Now, I did something that we're not really supposed to do. But I made some on him. I said, I don't really want to leave Yeshiva. Like, I don't, like, I've just got here. I don't really want to leave Yeshiva. So I said, there's some on him. I said, look, if there's certain things happen, then I should probably think about it. And one was that um, my music will go into the top 10 in the UK. A very hard market to get into as a musician. And uh, if I got into the top 10 in the music, in the, in, the, in the charts in the UK, I'd think about leaving Yeshiva. But I said, that's not really enough because it's doing really, really well. So there was a producer in America, I won't say his name, a very, very big producer. And I said, you know what, there was once talk that maybe I would work with him. And I said, if he gives me a call, I'll also think about leaving Yeshiva. Shortly after that, both those things happened. I told my Rosh Yeshiva, and he said, what have you done? What have you done? And I said, well, you know. And he said, yeah, you should go. You have to go take care of this. So uh, I left Yeshiva. And from having nothing, I was suddenly a top 10 Billboard artist in almost every country in the world. My song, that song Too Close, went to number one in the Billboard Airplay charts in the US for a few months. Um, you were more likely to hear Too Close on the radio in 2013, 2014 than any other song. It went to number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. It went to number one on the Billboard Indie charts in the US. It went to number four in the UK, number one in Germany, and sold just over six million copies worldwide. <laughs> The album it was on, The Lateness of the Hour, cumulatively sold just under 2 million copies worldwide. So from being a yeshiva bacher, learning in Yerushalayim, I was now a platinum selling artist. I went on tour for the next year and a half. Subsequently, I married my wife in that time, moved to Eretz for a while, went back on tour, made another album. And now, to, to commit to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to the words of my Rosh Yeshiva, I've come back to Yeshiva and I've been there now for the last 18 months. 
learning in Yerushalayim Hera Kodesh. So, uh, and, and what's more important is that I'm one of the only people in my shiru who supports himself 100%. Because, <laughs> because, because I, I have a very rich tati. And my tati, Baruch Hashem, he's given me lots of tiyata de shemaya, and uh, he's given me big brachas, and uh, I'm so grateful. And such a karasatav to the Ebeshter. You know, we say that um, to really understand what awe is, to understand what boiker is, the morning, we understand as Yidin that our calendar starts by night. Our day starts at night when the sun sets. There's a full drosha to be made to say that <coughs> is it possible that to really understand what Baker is, to really understand what the awe of the morning is, the light of the morning, you have to really understand what Choshek is. You have to understand what the Hest upon him is. And when you can see what the Hest upon him really is, that it's really just an opportunity that Kodesh Baruch is giving you to grow, that he can just give you so much Shefa. And so, Kaddish Baruch Hu is Goymel Chassidim Toivim. Now the Rebbe Reb Zishar of Hanipoli, he says that Goymel Chassidim Toivim, what does it mean? It's because the Vadai HaKaddish Baruch Hu is Chesed. He gives so much Chesed and he just wants to fill the world with Chesed. But Chesed isn't enough because if you give too much Chesed, it can be destructive. So we daven that we should have Chassidim Toivim, that it should be Chesed that's good. It should be Pitzad Rachamim, that it comes through mercy, i.e. with Gevura, and chesed in balance, that we should be able to have a keli, that we can actually deal with the shefa that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us. And Baruch Hashem, if I hadn't have had these opportunities, I don't know, I know I've known a lot of musicians, a lot of people in the music industry who've taken very destructive and very negative paths because they've been given so much in such a short period of time. And I understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when He gives us something, and He gives us His shefa, we have to be roi for it. And to be roi for it, we have to go through a, a shaping and a forming that makes us roi. So, Mr. Shem, we should all see our Kaddish Baruch Hu's brachas in abundance. And uh, from B'tzad Rachamim, Mr. Shem, thank you very much.